Frankfurt's argument from spiders is an argument against the view, which I was just offering you, according to which the mark that distinguishes your actions from things that merely happen to you is that actions are caused by your intentions, whereas things that merely happen to you are not, put very roughly. So Frankfurt opposes that view, and he tries to do that with this argument from spiders, as I call it. He doesn't call it that. Now, if you look at Frankfurt's paper, it's a very short paper, but it contains at least four arguments. You can find at least four arguments in that paper, maybe more. So it's a rich uh, paper. I've chosen to focus on this argument because I think it's the one with the most legs. So let's see how that argument goes. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the argument in Frankfurt's own words, just highlighting bits from the paper, and then I'm going to ask you with your lecture buddy to reconstruct the argument to put the argument in the form of a series of numbered premises and conclusions where you can tell me for each conclusion which premises that conclusion relies on. It's not going to take me very long. Before you know it, I'll be asking you to reconstruct the argument with your lecture buddy, so watch out. Let's go. The contrast between actions and mere happenings, says Frankfurt, can readily be, dis be discerned elsewhere than in the lives of people. There are, says Frankfurt, numerous agents besides ourselves who may be active as well as passive with respect to the movements of their bodies. And Frankfurt, interestingly, says this includes spiders. Why is that plausible? Well, you might be looking at a spider and it's moving there, crawling across its web. Or you might take the aforementioned spider in your hand and sort of move it across the web as if you were sort of puppeteering it. Now, in both cases, the spider moves across the web, but from the spider's point of view, one of those is an action when the spider's moving, and one of those is, from the spider's point of view, not an action at all. It's merely being moved across. Poor thing, it's probably all sort of cramped up uh, and upset. In fact, you'd be very upset if I actually did this. If I really brought a spider in and did that, you'd be very upset. You'd be thinking, poor spider. Uh, but most of the people thinking that are quite happy to eat very intelligent animals uh, for their lunch on the sandwiches. So there you go. Sorry, that's moral psychology, Steve. Uh, different module. Uh, why do people have the kind of views that they do about uh, various ethical matters? Uh, interesting question. Not this course. Mind in reality. Stick to the topic. Bad, Steve. Good. You get the idea. For spiders, there's a contrast between things it does and things that merely happen to it. Simple. All right, good. Frankfurt goes on. The two contrasts, the one in the case of humans and the one in the case of spiders, are the same. That's what Frankfurt says. Each contrasts instances in which the purposive behavior is attributable to a creature as agent and instances in which this is not the case. So that looks right, doesn't it? That when we talk about actions in the spider case, when we talk about actions in the human case, in both cases, we're contrasting things that really happen to them. And it looks like that's the same contrast. That there's nothing particularly special about the spiders or about the humans or about any of the other animals where we might apply this contrast. We want the contrast to apply generally. And that's important for Frankfurt's argument because that suggests that when we're answering the question, what is the mark that distinguishes actions, we should have an answer that applies to all of the animals where that distinction holds, rather than just to the humans. That would seem to be unmotivated if this is right. Frankfurt goes on. Explications of the distinction between actions and events that merely happen to an agent cannot rely on distinctive higher faculties which characteristically come into a play when a person acts, nor upon concepts which are inapplicable to spiders. I think that makes sense. If it's the same contrast in every case, we want a uniform account across the cases. So if there are things that spiders don't have, we can't appeal to those things in explaining the contrast. Seems to make sense. All right, good. Over to you. With your lecture buddy or lecture buddies, what I'd like you to do now, please, is in 90 seconds to reconstruct this argument. You're looking for a series of numbered premises. What are the premises? And you're looking for a series of numbered conclusions or you can say for each conclusion, which premises that relies on. 90 seconds, go.
OK, great. So I hope that you managed to get some way towards reconstructing the argument. It's a difficult thing to do in 90 seconds, and indeed you may well spend hours doing such an activity on occasion. Uh, and I encourage you to do this. If you really understand an argument from Frankfurt or somewhere else, then you ought to be able to reconstruct that as a, a list of premises and conclusions that you draw, where you can say exactly which conclusions depend on which premises. So here's my attempt to Here's my attempt to do this. Uh, what I'd like you to do actually is to check whether I'm right. You shouldn't trust me here. Uh, I'm often wrong about things, uh, frequently wrong about things. And I know that because I sometimes, I haven't taught this course before, but I've taught other courses uh, several times. And as I go back and teach courses again, I often discover that I made makes mistakes in previous versions. The best thing is that usually students are pointing out those mistakes. So be alert here. It may be that the reconstruction I'm offering you is not true to Frankfurt. And you need to check whether or not it is. I think it is. I'm not tricking you, uh, but you always need to check. So the first premise, I think, is that there is a contrast between actions and mere happenings in the lives of spiders. The second premise is that this contrast is the same in the lives of humans as it is in the lives of spiders. One contrast, one distinction to be explicated. Thirdly, Spiders do not have intentions, nor do they deliberate about what to do. I think Frankfurt needs, needs this premise for the argument to work. Uh, it's what, I've taken this from where Frankfurt talks about higher faculties. Uh, does he talk about higher faculties? And, and so on. I forget the exact words. Now, I can draw a conclusion immediately here. I can say from one and three, the contrast in the case of spiders cannot be explicated by appeal to intention. See how that works? That just follows from one and three. So there is a contrast that needs to be explicated, but they don't have intentions. So I'm hardly going to be able to draw the contrast in terms of their spidery intentions. There are none, according to the premise. And now from that premise four, together with two that I snuck in earlier, I can conclude that the contrast in the case of humans cannot be explicated by appeal to intention either. Because after all, since the contrasts are the same, I want the explication to be the same. Now let's step back and try to evaluate this argument. And here's a tip. A philosopher like Dretsky, when Dretsky offers us an argument, we're pretty sure that it's going to be a good argument. Interesting thing about Frankfurt, if Frankfurt offers you an argument, as a general rule, you can be pretty sure it's going to be a terrible argument. There'll be all kinds of holes in it and problems in it. And yet, here's the really interesting thing, Frankfurt is super interesting as a philosopher, really rewards studying, even though his abilities are entirely different to those of Dretsky. And that's why I thought actually it would be interesting to have both of them on the same first year course, so you can see different ways in which philosophers can be brilliant. Frankfurt, no question about it, is brilliant, but his arguments are characteristically appalling. Now, I think this is actually the best one. That's why I, I chose it, the one, as I say, with the most legs. So where are we? Um, I think this first premise is very hard to argue with. I think it's very clear. I illustrated this with the spider moving across the web versus you moving the spider across the web. I think it's very hard to argue that there's any absence of a contrast there. So we'll let that one stand. I think there's no, no alternative to that. The third premise, likewise, this we will come back to, but on the face of it, I think you're going to struggle to find a case in which a spider is weighing up two alternatives and has beliefs and desires which push it in both directions. And then after a process of deliberation, goes for one and stably pursues that one, that one direction. That's really the role of intention in the psychological explanation of action. If there is no deliberation between competing alternatives, both of which from one's own perspective seem quite favourable, there is of course no role for intention. So the bar for spiders to have intention is actually quite high. So for now I want to let that premise stand. Um, I did also say, last time I discussed this argument on a different course, I, I, I made the following comment. I said, no matter how much research you do, you will not come up with a convincing argument for the claim that spiders have intentions. I just want to confess that I said that, and you'll see why that's a confession later. 
in a later section. OK, so this, I think, is a good premise. We're going to hold on to this premise. What about the claim that the contrast in the lives of humans is the same? Here, I think, there is a genuine weakness. A defender of Frankfurt's argument might say is this. Look, you're just starting to think about action. It would be a mistake to assume at the outset that spiders and humans are different with respect to what marks out actions from things that merely happen to them. Now, that I think is right. We shouldn't rely on that assumption. But of course, Frankfurt's relying on the assumption that there is no distinction between the spiders and the humans. The contrasts are the same. I think it's dubious to rely on that as well at this stage because we haven't really fully explored the matter. Uh, so, so here, at the very least, you can say it looks like if I was going to construct an objection, this is the vulnerability that I would probably be looking for. Although, of course, you shouldn't take my word for it. You're the philosopher in the room. You should be looking where the other potential points of vulnerability are. So here we've got Frankfurt's argument from spiders. And what I've done is, first of all, I introduced it in Frankfurt's own words, and then I asked you to reconstruct a version of it. And if things have gone well, you might have a version where you can look at it and say, it's a bit like mine. So you might have different premises in different orders. You may have chosen to add something as a premise to make it explicit that I'm relying on implicitly or conversely. But if things have gone well, you've got something which is very close to what I've got, and that will be great. But of course, things don't always go well. And when I've done this in the past, many students in the room have not reconstructed anything like the reconstruction that I've offered. So 90 seconds with your lecture buddy. Is there anything that you don't understand about this argument? If so, try to articulate a question. If you do understand the argument, is it sound and is it valid? 90 seconds, go. Excellent. So here we have a reconstruction of Frankfurt's argument from spiders. Going on from here, I want to take it that we all understand the reconstruction, and so we're in a position to work out whether we think the argument is sound, has true premises, and whether we think it's valid, whether the conclusions follow from those premises.